Welcome back to your Feel Good Breakfast Show. This is Expresso. We're live, large and in charge. It's a Tuesday morning and always so good to have your company and including the company of our resident, Dr. Darren Green. And uh, of course, this year's theme for World Cancer Day is I Can, We Can. Now, it acknowledges that everyone has a capacity to address the cancer burden where 9.6 million people die each year from cancer. Now, the astounding thing is that that is more than HIV, AIDS, malaria and tuberculosis combined. Mm. So today we'll be discussing the top two most prevalent cancers in females and males respectively. And uh, he is here to help us out and to understand mm. our trusted medical professional, Dr. Darren Green. Always good to have you. you here, Signore. Thank you. Always good. Mm. Our lines are open. You can give us a call if you have any questions. 021-430-9881. Let's get into it. Hmm. Well, Doctor, let's put the spotlight on breast cancer. I, funny wow. enough, saw an... It's not that it's funny. I saw an article yesterday on how to do the check. So I think at the ah. end of the day, some people are still asking, how is breast cancer detected? Yes, I think the first thing is that people can have breast cancer and not even know that they do. Mm. So if you aren't looking for it, you might not even find the early signs of okay. screening, which could uh, obviously treat and prevent it developing into a serious stage and form of cancer down the line. So, uh, you know, the, the big things with breast cancer is that you need to do a self-examination check, and the recommended time period is once a month mm -hmm. for ladies. Um, and that you also need to know how to do it. And there are hundreds of videos online for people that don't know how to examine the breast, yes. uh, etc. Lumps, skin changes, color changes, contour changes, even around the areola and the nipples, for example, also cannot be ignored. Okay. So sometimes it's not about having a big lump or bump in the breast. It's just this subtle color and skin change on the external surface of the breast. Yeah. And uh, those things need to be checked out. So you can have it checked out, sorry to interrupt, at the, at your, at the clinic. You yep. can go to the clinic, you can go to your That's doctor. Right. So there's a lot of people that can help you just examine and make sure it's okay. Absolutely, don't make assumptions that it's nothing. Especially if it's something that comes on that's new and, and changes to things like symmetry and contour and so forth and the, the skin quality. Uh, and then definitely get your, your uh, even your, your, your clinic sister nurse will start the process uh, along with a doctor, whether you're in the state sector or have medical aid or not. You should have it checked out at your private clinic or your GP. <coughs> and then from there on, obviously, the, the risk factors around developing breast cancer will be managed and looked, looked at. Yeah, and as you can see on your screen, as Dr. Darren Green was discussing, the Breast Cancer Awareness Month, check your yep. breast methods, all the different uh, techniques you need to apply in order to So many check symptoms, yourself, pain, right? skin texture, <coughs> the shape and size of the breast, a discharge from the nipples, redness, etc., thickening of the skin, and then the nipples can actually retract or be even become abnormally inverted. Mm -hmm. okay. So, yeah. So, let's talk about the next step and what happens after you have detected that you might have one of these symptoms. symptoms. So, you'd see your, your clinician <coughs> or a health professional who will then d decide what route needs to be followed. So, depending on the presentation of the abnormality, if it's a lump or a bump, uh, a, a biopsy in the form of a fine needle aspiration might be required. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's done under guidance of doing a sonar as well first. Uh, and then obviously things like a mammogram are then advised to go and look at the tissue itself, uh, look at where exactly the tissue is. For those that don't know, a mammogram is a special type of x-ray uh, to, to examine the breast itself mm -hmm. uh, with a much lower dose of radiation than a normal x-ray is, for okay. example, a chest x-ray. And that came about in about 19, uh, 1977, 1980. I think some very interesting details that we're going to be delving into, especially the fact that this is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And so we're going to keep our lines open, 0214309881, as we continue to engage with our medical professional, Dr. Darren Green, about all things cancer. With Dr. Darren Green, and yesterday was World mm. Cancer Day. This morning, for our medical health chat, we are talking all things cancer. Earlier, we discussed breast cancer. This morning, we are now moving on to the next part of cervical cancer. Our lines are open if you have a comment or a question, so feel free to call us. Our number is 021 430 All right, already we have the graphics out for you to see mm -hmm. at home. Let's talk about who is most at risk of developing cervical cancer and perhaps maybe even taking a back step and discussing the cervix and why it is prone to such... Absolutely. Uh, I think uh, one of the big things, a lot of people don't know where the cervix is and yes. cervix uh, is from the Latin word, it means neck, mm -hmm. so cervical spine or cervical spine. In the case here, the neck obviously to the uterus and uh, that's the cervix. So you have the, the column or the, the pathway of the vagina moving towards the neck 
of the uterus and the cervix is right at that point over there. And that's where the two different types of skin come together. The skin lining this canal and then the skin as we enter into the, that canal at the cervix are two different types of skin. Mm. Okay. So when that junction or that transitional zone is put under stress or pressure, that's where the cells start to replicate and to multiply. And with cancer, you have then the production of abnormal shaped cells, abnormal DNA cells that then multiply at rapid rates, giving you tumors in that area specifically. So that's why we can pick up and detect uh, cervical cancer by doing, for example, what's called a pap smear. Uh, and the pap smear takes a sample of the skin, uh, obviously, at that area, those cell types, and then we can actually see the abnormalities. Remember that the, the cancer can be triggered specifically, this type of cancer, by HPV, which is a virus. Very strong association with the human papillomavirus mm -hmm. and the incidence of, of uh, cervical cancer. Okay. Right. Well, Dr. Darren Green, we have a caller on the line. <laughs> Jessica, good morning. Good morning. How are you? We are do go doing good. Thank you. What's your comment or question for Dr. Darren Green this morning? Hi, Dr. Darren. How are you? Fantastic. Thanks. That's good. I'm glad to hear that. Um, my mom was just recently diagnosed with um, kidney cancer, and she had her kidney, urethra, and a part of her bladder removed. Hmm. Now, our question is um, to find out whether, like, is there any specific food that she should be eating, any food shakes that she should be drinking to try and prevent that from, from spreading or, hmm. um, you know, to get her healthier? Thank you. Good Thank question. You. So, Thank you, Jessica. So incredible question uh, surrounding diet and cancer. Mm. This sounds like quite an extensive cancer that needed aggressive surgery. So the staging of the cancer is obviously quite important and uh, could be even stage three cancer. That's what it sounds like over there. We're not sure if it's spread to the lymph system in that case as well. But aggressive surgery is nonetheless. When it comes to, to post cancer or intra-cancer treatment uh, nutrition. It's a highly specialized field and they're actually uh, dietitians and nutritionists that specialize in that field. What we do know is that the impact of your diet and lifestyle on cancer and even your ability to handle things like chemo and radiotherapy are very dependent on your diet, your levels, for example, of your liver and your kidneys being able to handle uh, that, those drugs, for example, as you do that. So you need to preserve that function by looking after the liver in terms of a healthy, balanced diet. You could also look at a lot of people go on to a lot of plant-based uh, diets uh, during that time and eat a lot healthier in terms of the macro and micronutrients. Okay. So a lot of people believe in looking after good gut health, speci specifically with things like nausea and vomiting mm -hmm. and that as side effects to the treatment. Yeah. So I would recommend that they actually see a nutrition specialist uh, in cancer care and oncology to help them, but certainly uh, away from fatty foods and definitely a more healthy, balanced uh, diet in terms of loads of vegetables mm. and then looking at the micronutrients as well. All right. Thanks for the great advice there. And thank you, thank you for the call yeah. and the very engaging question. We're going to keep those lines open. 0214309881. We'll be right back with Dr. Darren Green. It's my feel-good breakfast show. Welcome back. It's a feel-good breakfast show. It's a Tuesday morning. We're live, large and in charge. And thank you. It's so good to have you here mm. tuned in on this Tuesday morning where we're talking all things cancer. Yes. Um, Dr. Darren Green is here. We've spoken about breast cancer. Mm -hmm. We've spoken about cervical cancer. Now we move on to our next topic, prostate cancer, one, yes. of course, prevalent among men. Yes. Um, so I think we, we have spoken about this before, but there's always need for a refresher, mm. um, just as we did with, with breast cancer, talking about self-examinations. So when it comes good. to prostate cancer, let's first examine where exactly exactly we're talking about in the body when we speak of the prostate. prostate. Yes, yeah, so what you're seeing over here, the big orange halo that looks like Mars is actually the bladder. Mm. And uh, as the urethra drains the bladder and the urine takes that path, wrapped around the urethra at the neck of the bladder, you find a walnut-like structure there. And that's the prostate. Mm. Oh. And the prostate is a very, very fascinating organ in that its, its function is actually to assist in producing the fluid that houses the sperm cells and nourishes them. Mm. That's the function of the prostate. Mm. That gives that, uh, that quality to the ejaculate or semen. So that's what you're seeing, that's where it is. Yeah. And that red fiery ball there is just depicting where tumor can actually occur <coughs> in the prostate. Okay. So when that swells closed, if the prostate gets bigger and bigger and bigger, it can actually uh, you know, compress the pipe of the urine that's draining in the urethra, mm -hmm. and that then leads to the symptoms of dribbling, a slow mm -hmm. stream, etc., and where you can't uh, 
Knape off. <laughs> yeah. uh, so you have those symptoms and you have uh, obviously the urgency, the frequency, where you feel that you want to go and you've got a massive amount of urine, mm. but only a little bit comes out at a time. And those are called the LUTs symptoms, the lower urinary tract symptoms. Okay. okay. So you've explained that, which is good, right? Uh, when you speak about the prostate, you can't not speak about the prostate gland, which you've spoken about before on the show. Yeah. But what is the prostate gland and what exactly then does it do? In it's that exactly process? the same thing. Is it exactly so the prostate the same and the prostate thing? gland is exactly same the same story. thing. Yeah, okay. it, it is a gland and it, manu it manufactures or makes yeah. a, a, a substance, and that's why it's called a gland. Mm. Glands normally manufacture something and secrete it. Yeah. So you've mentioned the symptoms then of prostate cancer. What else can we? Uh, how can we tell? How can we self-examine at home? For yes. Example? Well, you can't. You can just, uh, you know, obviously take notice when you go to the toilet that it takes you two and a half minutes to urinate mm. instead of like one minute when you were like five years younger. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Something's happened in terms of the flow, the speed and the volume that you're producing. And then also, as I mentioned, the dribbling, uh, the, yeah. you know, where, you, where it, it just leaks slowly. Yeah. So those are very important lower urinary tract symptoms. So if you see those symptoms, you'd have your urine che checked first to exclude something like a simple infection. And if that is treated and the symptoms persist, then you'll look deeper to look at that. And there's obviously blood tests involved mm. <clears throat> as well, that you can do the prostate PSA test, prostate-specific antigen, and then obviously the prostate check, which is a digital check and a sonar, which can be done if you have any of those other screening pickups that are mm. abnormal. Yeah, and mm. there we can see on that graphic there the difference between yes, a healthy prostate and uh, one that has, uh, that has been enlarged as a result mm -hmm. of the cancer. What causes prostate cancer. Mm. What are the triggers? I mean, I, I know that for a time it was believed that cyclists who wear very tight, tight short, shorts <laughs> and have to be saddled up in that awkward position, mm. that could be a possible trigger for prostate cancer. Yeah. I, I believe that myth was kind of yes, not avoided. Yeah. Yeah? So, uh, you know, the, the risk, as in for any cancers, mm. genetically there's a risk that the gene can be triggered or switched on by different things. Environmental things, things in your diet, hormonal factors, and then obviously the genetic link itself yeah. uh, of having cancer in, 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 your, in your family. Yeah. So many multifactorial contributions to why certain people yeah. develop it and others is, not. Is there a certain age of people that are more prone to getting prostate cancer? So Certainly. Over the age of, of 40, the incidence increases compared to testicular cancer, which is the cancer of young males aged between, you know, from 18 to 30. Mm. But the big thing with prostate uh, cancer, obviously, is also understanding the, the need to be screened early, very yeah. early, because we can do a lot about it. Yeah, mm. I think that's a general rule for all cancers and you, just your health in general. That yeah. annual checkup is so necessary. Uh, our lines are going to be open 0214309881. Needed to keep that number at the back mm. of my mind. Uh, we've spoken breast cancer, cervical cancer, prostate cancer. Next uh, up, we'll be tackling lung cancer with Dr. Darren Green. And we're back again with Dr. Darren Green, our uh, medical chat today revolving around World Cancer Day, which was yesterday. We've spoken through uh, the ins and outs of breast cancer, cervical cancer, prostate cancer, and now we touch on lung cancer. But before we do that, mm. we've got some questions on social media, one sure. of which was uh, if you could please share some information on HPV vaccines and their efficiency. And the second question was where the teens can get breast cancer. Yeah, so HPV, mm. obviously the human papilloma virus, yeah. strong association with the cerv cervical cancer. Mm. Uh, massive impact certainly on the incidence of uh, you know, cervical cancer since the introduction of the vaccination. Mm. Yes, it's a, it's a vaccination that requires uh, what's called a booster vaccination. So one now, one in three months or one in six months. Mm. Uh, and the, the government has rolled it out in all our clinics for children or uh, girls aged nine years and up already. Mm. They've done phase two already in the Western Cape, I'm aware of that. But certainly very, very uh, effective. Mm -hmm. And uh, with the risks involved of, of contracting uh, HPV, you need to get the vaccine in very early to make it the most effective it possibly can. Mm. If you are older, it's still worth taking it because there are yeah. different subtypes of HPV yes. that are covered by the, by the, uh, the different uh, vaccinations. All right, mm. and the second question about uh, whether teens are or can yes, develop you can. breast cancer. Both men or uh, boys and girls can develop cancer in, t in their teenage years mm. of the breasts. The breast tissue has the ability to be triggered by other things as well mm -hmm. early on, and certain types of breast cancer certainly are more common in the younger, younger individuals. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Well, we've got a caller on the line, uh, Dr. Darren Green. It's Jean from Cape Town. Jean, good morning. Good morning, Dr. Darren. Good morning. Uh, good yes, morning. I want to just ask you this question. I, I was diagnosed with a drop uterus. 
Yes. And people are telling me uh, eventually it might uh, turn can uh, cancerous if I don't uh, do anything about it. Okay. Uh, what must I do? Yes, uh, the, the word they often use is uterine prolapse, where, it, uh, where the ligaments that suspend it, if you think about a, even a car's engine is suspended with different nuts and bolts keeping it in place, those ligaments yeah. become weak uh, and uh, can also become what's called subluxed and then the uterus can actually uh, drop. Mm -hmm. So what happens is that look at the degree of it causing obstruction of the, of the urinary tract and also other complications around uh, the, the surrounding structures and then make a decision whether actually lifting it or actually doing surgery around the, the procedure would be, would be necessary in this case. So what kind of surgery is that? So you'd see a, 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 a gynecologist, uh, specifically a urogyne, and they'll be able to assess firstly at what stage the uterine prolapse is and to see if there's anything they could do to actually increase the stability and support of the uterus. And if not, then they will discuss a few surgical options with you. Okay, so, so what do they do through the vagina or a normal... Um... It would depend on the size of the uterus as well as oh. the stage of the prolapse. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Darren, but it won't turn can cancerous in the meantime. No, it is, uh, you know, the uterine prolapse doesn't mean you have cancer, so I suggest yeah, you, you see them as soon as yeah, possible. Yeah, and it's also, it gives off a, 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 a terrible smell, you know. I've got to wash myself about three, four times a day. Okay, well, good luck, and uh, we, we wish you well. Thank you very much for the call. Okay, very engaging call at the end. Now, I just want to skip past, the, I guess, maybe let's say the basics of, of lung sure. cancer, because I want to get to some of the deeper questions. Because, I mean, I think just like any other cancer, environmental issues play a role, genetics play a role, lifestyle. This one, this one um, lifestyle and smoking so is a massive exactly. one. Yeah. That's a massive one. So yeah. those are some of the, 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 the things that would put you at risk of developing lung cancer. Let's Correct. talk about the symptoms. How do you yes. know? You yeah, have it. lung cancer. Well, often you, 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 a cough, a chronic cough that doesn't go away needs to be uh, checked out. What's long enough? If you've been coughing for longer than six weeks, mm. you need to have it checked out. Mm. If you have a productive cough with blood-stained mu uh, mucus or, or sputum, that needs to be checked out. If you have pleuritic pain, mm. pain with, uh, around your lungs and when you cough, that's mm. abnormal, <coughs> it needs to be checked out. And then obviously the other things about cancer are severe weight loss, mm. loss of appetite and all that, but that normally comes at a much later stage. Mm. So you don't actually know, and, uh, you know until it's actually too late. So mm. be aware of that. Productive cough, blood stain sputums, and then as I mentioned, the chron chronicity of it and pain. Yeah. Are there instances where people confuse lung cancer for TB and they think they've got TB? 100%, yes. Um, they do, because TB presents with a chronic cough, it presents mm -hmm. with a productive sputum and blood, but you won't know until you do until the x-ray that yeah. it's not the typical, uh, you know, uh, apical cavitations or clinical x-ray picture of TB with the sputum confirmation, mm -hmm. unless you go and be, uh, have the test done and are actually, uh, you know, have confirmatory tests. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Would you say just in general, go and do your annual checkups and Absolutely. just to make sure that you are in good order? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So 80, 80 to 90% percent of lung cancers are associated with smoking, 90% in, in males. 80% in females are linked to smoking. Yeah. Mm. So that uh, isolated woman, Tani, that's been smoking for 40 years that never got cancer is really the, the, the rare, rarity. very rarity. Mm. So. Yeah. Dr. Darren Green, as always, we appreciate your time and expertise and uh, we hope to see you again soon. Of course, we'll be doing this on Tuesday. Again. Thank you. And thank you to our callers as well. Let's continue the feel-good vibes.